Good morning. morning. I got a favor to ask you guys. By the raising of your hands, how many of you have a dollar? Right now, a dollar. Raise your hand. I have to ask first. I'm going to do something here, and if you didn't have a dollar, it's not going to work. Where are my deacons at? Donald, can you give me a plate, an empty plate? Bring it to the front. Uh, you kids, you're not like uh, shy, are you? Yeah. Brandon? Brandon? Junior? Yeah. Hello. Brandon? Yeah. I know you're not shy. <laughs> but I want you guys to do is those of you who have a dollar, I want you to take it out of your pockets or your wallets or your purses and hold it up because I want these kids to come pick it up. And then I want you to put it in this plate here. This is the beginning of our children taking up offering that's going to go to the four, uh, what did you say, Marty? Uh, young Sabbath School. For the Sabbath School expenses. As yeah. you look around, you see we have children now. We would use this for children's Sabbath School expenses as we need it. And um, what this will do, hopefully, is allow us to continue to have children week after week after week after you get done with the offering. Then I'm going to tell you a story. Is that okay? Yeah. So, Brianna, come take this, put that up there. Those of you who have a dollar, I want you to hold the dollar up in your hands. And all you children need to come up. Junior, I want you to go, and Brianna, and all you guys, I want you to take the dollars out of these people's hands. And come and bring it and put it in this bag, okay? What you're going to find is adults love to give out these dollars because they love to see the look on your face. So I was too big to get in there. 
my wife wasn't going to get in there. Um, and so the only one that could actually fit would be a kid, somebody around 10 years old. Okay? So he was not liking enclosed spaces. There's a word for that. Do you know what that word is? Very good. So we told him, listen, if you want to get these puppies out, I need you to crawl underneath there, and I need you to grab them and bring them to the I want to save these puppies. I don't want anything to happen to them, but I don't know if I can do that. And I told him this verse, that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And he looked at me and I said, listen, let's have a prayer. And if you feel that you can go in there, I go, I'll be right here. And if you get stuck, I'll come right in behind you. I said, but I want to see if you can do this. And so we prayed, told him to repeat the verse. And he repeated the verse. I said, you think you can go in there? Because I'll try. He crawled in there, he crawled in there. And of course, the mother dog put the dog exactly in the middle of the street. So as he's crawling through there, it's dark. And he has to crawl over all the stuff that collects in the drain, not to mention have rain a long time. You know what goes into a drain and makes nice webs? Right? So he's dealing with the spiders and he's dealing with all the stuff. But he goes in there and I'm talking to him, asking if he's okay, he's okay. And I can hear him say, I got one. And now he's in there face forward and he has to come back. And there's not enough room to actually turn around. So he has to crawl back out with the puppy. And he does it and he brings out one. He goes in there and gets another one. He brings out another one. He crawls back in there, crawls back out. And he does this and he gets every one of those puppies out of there. And you can see when he brought out the first one, he was nervous, but not as nervous as he was when he first went in there. By the time he brought out the second one, he wasn't nervous at all. All he was thinking about was getting those puppies out of there. And by the time he got the last one out, he wasn't scared at all. So I tell you this to let you know that when you see a Bible verse like that, that I can do all things, that's not just for people my age, people your parents' age. That's for all of us, especially people your age. As you continue to grow up and you deal with all the things at school, at home, realize that God is with you, Christ is with you everywhere you go, and through Him you can do all things. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and we'll have a prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these young people, for these children. Thank you and I praise you for bringing them here today. I pray that you will bless them, that you will strengthen them, and that you will use them as your ambassadors in whatever they do in this life. Pray that you will continue to walk with their parents as well. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, you guys can go back. Gilbert, you did a great job. <laughs> So, Marty, i got to ask you this. Yes, sir. I think for collecting the adult offering, you should do the same thing. <laughs> have the kids collect it, but have the adults pull out the real money. Is that <laughs> one, of the thing, one of the things I learned is that children collect more money, women collect the second, and the deacons collect the least. <laughs> I agree. That is statistical. I agree. Turn with me to your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, let's look at verses 2 through 4 again. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of what? Christ is spirit, Christ is life, and Christ gives us life. Amen. Because we have and are born with a fallen human nature, that brings us death. Paul says that the wages of sin is what? Amen. Death. Okay? So the wages of sin is death. When God created Adam and Eve, did he create them to sin? That's right. See, so they were never supposed to come under the condemnation of the law. This is why Paul is able to say that the law is just and holy and good. 
There's nothing wrong with the law. What I find is that there's something wrong with me. But what I find in Christ is that He supplies all of my needs. Amen. Verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak, the law was weak. How was the law weak? What does it say? Through the flesh. Again, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is a transcript of God's character. Amen. It tells you that you can have confidence that God will never lie to you. God would never steal from you. God is never going to put anybody or anything above Him because He is God. That you can trust Him. And that He gives you a special day that you can come and worship Him. So nothing wrong with the law, but the problem is it's me, right? We, the, the, the flesh is weak because we broke with the law. We got in, you know, brotherhood with Satan. So this is what this verse 3 means. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son. What was it that the law could not do? Exactly. Very good. The law cannot save you. All the law is there to do is to show you what is right and what happens if you do the opposite. Right? So the law now to a bunch of lawbreakers becomes something that condemns us. So what God did is send Christ to save us. So again, God is able to supply all of my needs and to grant me such great salvation that in Him I can do all things. Verse 3 again, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, Christ condemned sin in the flesh. How did Christ condemn sin in the flesh? He took it on. He took it on and He conquered it. You guys understand that? That Christ overcame. He came through the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yes. That was His Father, right? Yes. Because conception takes two. Is that right? So, who was Christ's mother? Mary. All right. What kind of nature did Mary have? <laughs> so, what Christ brings to us is victory. Amen. Victory, victory, victory. Why? Because He overcame sin and the world. And how did He do it? The same way that He offers to us. And that is by our relationship with His Father. Amen. And that relationship comes through Him. But listen, God is so loving and God is so caring for you that the Bible says, I would that you sin not. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who's that advocate? Jesus. What is an advocate? A lawyer. Okay? Someone to defend you. And not only is he your lawyer, but he's also your substitute. So he defends you and he takes your place. What more can you ask for? For God to save you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law, is the law righteous? Amen. Yes. Is there anything wrong with the righteousness of the law? No. The problem is, is I can't have that righteousness, nor can I keep it, nor can I make it. Because in this flesh, I'm a sinner. That's how I was born, is that right? But doesn't Christ offer me rebirth? Amen. Am I not born again? And when I'm born again, am I not a new creation? All things have passed away. All things have become new. What is it that's new? Because believe me, when I went into the, the water of baptism, and I came up, I looked the same way. <laughs> Spirit. 
I was wetter. I might have smelled a little bit better. I realized that after church, it took about maybe a day before I realized that that old guy was still inside. But what I came to learn through maturity in Christ is what Paul said in the verse that I read to you, is that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that Christ is able to change not just what I let you see. You know, you let me see certain things of you, of who you really are. God sees all of who I really am. And He doesn't leave me there. But what I found in walking with Christ for three decades is that He changes my heart. He changes my character. And He makes me more and more like Himself. Amen. Amen. This, this one truth, brothers and sisters, is the thing that keeps me in God's church, worshiping with God's people. Because I'm able to see this change in God's people. I can see from worshiping with them, from talking with them, how God has worked in their lives and how God has changed them. Now, does that mean I'm perfect? Those of you who know me know that that is definitely not true. Okay? But I also know that it's not true for yourselves as well. So see, God has lumped us all in the same boat, which is why we're not supposed to judge which is why we're supposed to love, and this is why grace covers a multitude of what? Sins. Okay? So because we're in the same boat, then I can relate to you and your struggles, you can relate to me and my struggles, and together we can help and hold each other up. Marty, what, was, what would happen if you stood up without your crutches? <laughs> um, I wouldn't be able to stand very long. Okay? So the crutch on each side gives you strength and balance. Is that right? This is what God promises to do for each one of us. He doesn't use the symbolism of a crutch, but what He uses is the symbolism of a yoke. You know what a yoke is? Something that you put around the neck of an ox or a cow. Okay? The yoke is something that holds that big old animal in place. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Why? Because you're not put to that yoke by yourself. Christ is right there with you, and you're yoked together with Him. And listen, when you fall, He's right there to pick up your slack. And if you can't pick up that slack, He's right there to pick you up. And He will take your slack, and He will take you. And when you're strong enough, He places you back down again. That's the God that you serve. That's the Savior that we worship. Truly, Scripture is right when it says, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Amen? Amen. Thank you. What is that? I said, don't look at the clock. <laughs> Listen, we were at lunch last week, and... and there was a, the pastor for Daytona. He's a real pastor. And we were talking. You're a real pastor. <laughs> Hold on, let me, let me explain this to you. We were talking, and, and he, he made the, the comment that he was kind of long-winded because he was speaking for over half an hour, and I laughed. <laughs> but I told him, I said, that's the difference between somebody who's been trained and went to seminary. I said, you're able to get out all the fluff in the beginning, and you can just... You know, 30 minutes is good. So I'm, I'm trying to, to get you guys out in like 35. <laughs> Sabbath all day, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. You understand that? The righteous requirement of the law is not fulfilled in Christ. Who's it going to be fulfilled in? Yes. Us. Why? Because Jesus lives in us. All right? And so if He lives in you, then the law is being fulfilled in you. The righteous requirement. Have you ever thought about what God actually requires for you to be saved? Perfection. How high is the bar? Perfection. 
perfection. Never sinning in one thought or one deed or one word. Never. Ever. Now this is the life that your Savior led on this earth. This is why Jesus is a man, is a man among men and a God among gods. This is why he can be your Savior. Because he did this, not because he had to, because he wanted to. Do you realize that when he went to the cross, he could see your face and my face, and it was enough to keep him there? You think those nails could have held him there? No. Didn't he tell his disciples that he could call down three angels? And legions of angels who would do whatever he said. But he wanted to stay there because that was the only way you and I could ever be saved. Christ, our righteousness. You never forget that. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the what? But according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit will set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is what? Yeah. Understand that, brothers and sisters. If your mind is set on the things of the world, if that's your focus, if that's your desire, the end product will be death. But we are called not to live in this flesh, but to live in God's spirit. And that's how you overcome this world, because that's how Christ overcome the world. The problem is, is what does that actually mean in my day-to-day -day life? Okay, right? So what that means in my day-to-day -day life is when I wake up in the morning, I have to make a decision right then. What is my mind going to be thinking of? Is it going to be thinking of something that draws me away from Christ? Or is it going to be thinking of something that's going to strengthen me in Christ? Here's an example. When I wake up in the morning, what I do is think of a hymn or a, a contemporary Christian song that I know. I love music. Um, and if I could have learned math the way I learned lyrics to songs, I'd be a genius. It didn't work out that way. But I, my wife would drive her crazy. I told you that it's a blessing and a curse. I remember what I hear, and I remember what I read. And so she could be in another room watching a TV show, and if I watch it, all I have to do is hear maybe three words of, and I don't know what it is. So I have to watch what I watch. And what I hear, because I don't forget it. I don't forget pictures or images and things like that. My daughter wakes up, and the first thing she wants to watch is TV. Okay? Things of the world, things of the flesh, or the things of the spirit. So that's the first thing in the morning, because I need something to keep me focused as I leave that house, because when I leave that house, then the day really starts. And then I have to go outside and see, well, is my equipment still there or did it get stolen overnight? Or is it broken? Right, right? Yeah. Or, or uh, a thousand other things that is going to come in and start to monopolize your time. So if you have children and they wake up and they need to be fed, they need to be clothed, they need to go to school and all this stuff has to be done, right? And yet you still have to have time to have your mind focused on Christ. How do you do that? Well, that all depends on whether you're living in the flesh or you're living in the spirit. What is it that you want? What is it that dominates your time? I asked my Sabbath school class this this morning. I asked you this as well. Think of how much time you spend <coughs> watching certain, any type of media, whether it's television, whether it's your computer, whether it's your phone. Think of how much time during a day you spend on that. And then how much time do you actually spend in the Word of God? That could be either the Bible itself, uh, reading uh, 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 one of our magazines, whether it's a book, but 
Contrast the two. And how much time? Now think about this. I run a landscaping business. Um, I cut grass. And so there's a lot of times I'm out of the lawnmower. I have a lot of time for my mind just to run free. So what do you do? And where's your mind going? Paul says that he takes every thought and brings it captive. Do you know how hard that is? Word. It is work. It's right. It's a discipline. Yeah. Just like prayer is a discipline. Okay. Not letting your mind wander to the things of this earth, the things of this flesh. That's hard because all around you you're bombarded by the things that feed your flesh, feed that carnal nature. But you, do you control your mind? Does God control your mind? Does the devil control your mind? Who actually controls your mind? The answer is you. God doesn't wave a magic wand over you. God doesn't say these are the parameters that your brain is only going to think of and it's not going to go beyond this. You control your thoughts. You control your mind. The devil can't read it. But God can. That's why it says he knows every secret thought and in the judgment those things will be brought out. But you know what? You have an advocate. Who is a what? A mediator and a lawyer. You have an advocate. He's your lawyer, but he's also your substitute. Christians, if you are walking with Christ, you have nothing to fear for the judgment. Nothing. Because it's Christ and Christ alone that will bring you through the other end of the judgment. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, taking every thought captive and not allowing it to wander and focus on things that weaken you in the spirit, that takes discipline.